higher education, financial aid, and college admissions, the three of us are very excited to be working with you and your student. I know this can be a very stressful and uncertain time for you and your student, and there are many questions and steps. We're here to help, plan, help them plan whether they're attending college next year, if that's their goal, um, if they're going to go straight to the workforce, military, or entrepreneurial work. Tonight, we're going to focus a lot in on college, um, since 80% of our students, that is their path right after high school. And when we met with the students last week in English class, we told them we all want them to understand how to apply to a two- and four-year college. Um, because even if that's not their plan and path now, or maybe won't even be at graduation, it may be later. So we wanted to make sure that they all were ready um, to apply to college if they so choose to. And we want to make sure that um, we really bring you in on what we shared with them in class, um, because if they're like my kids, anything that we tell the teacher tells them to bring this paper home or make sure you tell your mom and dad, I never hear about it. So we're going to go over everything we told them with you tonight, and then also how you as a parent and guardian can and help them through this process. You didn't get any handouts. For the first time, we're not doing handouts, so if you would like to take um, a picture there uh, of the QR code, that would get you to the presentation, which I highly recommend because the presentation does have a lot of links in it. Um, so I'll give you a minute to go ahead and bring up the presentation. Does anyone need more time? I see some phones still up. I'll give a couple more minutes. And since this is live stream, we will email out the link if you want to rewatch tonight's evening. Um, we will also share out the presentation via email. So as I mentioned, um, each student has a college and career counselor. We adopted this model a few years ago. Um, so we want to make sure that we give a lot of time and attention to juniors and especially seniors to help uh, with, with their plans after high school. Um, myself, Mrs. Bayslock, and Mr. Drypolcher, we're constantly connecting with colleges and universities across the country to gather the most up-to-date information about admissions, financial aid, and other important aspects of college to make sure we can pass that along to you and your student. We hope that you will connect with the counseling office and your assigned counselor so that we can pass this important information along to you. There are several different ways to do that. Um, on Monday, usually Monday afternoon, we send out a weekly update from our office. Um, a lot of that pertains directly to seniors. We have currently the information in there as the presentation we did with them, colleges that are coming here on campus to visit with them. So just you'll see a lot more scholarship information coming out in, in the near future. So make sure you're checking those. And we told your student also to check them. So it comes to both the student and parent. If you're not getting those, please email um, the appropriate counselor so we can make sure that you start getting those weekly updates. We also have a Twitter page. Um, obviously, we're accessible for in-person meetings, email uh, questions, or you can call us, and you have our information on the previous slide. There is a section of the website, of the high school website, under counseling that says senior resources. That's where we put all the information that, you're, um, that you'll need for financial aid, the senior packet, which we're going to go over tonight, um, or transcript requests forms, counselor recommendation request forms, all of that is housed under the senior resource section of the counseling website. And then we did tell your son or daughter that we want to meet with them and you in a one-on-one -on -one meeting. So when we talked to them last week, it was a bunch of general information, 
but we want them to schedule a time to come in so that we can understand their specific goals and aspirations and help them um, with, with whatever they need help with, whether it's their common application, if they need help with Naviance scholarships. So we are encouraging all students and families to schedule one-on-one -on -one appointment, and when we share this presentation out, or if you have it right now, you just click on that link and put the days and times you're available. Um, and if you want to, it's up to you. Sometimes the students meet with us on their own first and then invite the parent, or we do it at the same time. Sometimes the student's in person, the parent is at work, zooming in. Whatever is, um, works for your schedule, we're happy to accommodate. So kind of just to take you through, you know, behind the scenes, if it wasn't shared home with you, what we've been doing um, with the seniors to date. So they've done a lot of college entrance exam test prep. Um, they've done a pre-ACT since freshman year. Every year they've taken the PSAT. They took the SAT last March. So they've had opportunities for college entrance exams. Through Naviance and us coming into the classroom um, since freshman year, they've done career and college exploration. Um, you can ask them about that. You have your own login as a parent to Naviance, and they have a student login. So whether you go in on their account or yours, you can see all of the different um, college and career searches that they've completed to date. Most of those they can redo. You know, some of the career assessments they did as freshmen, we recommend that they redo that because they're certainly probably different people than they were freshman year. Um, we've been meeting with them in classroom guidance. I think the juniors last year, we met with them three times, I believe. They created a resume last year. They're supposed to be updating it right now with what they did this summer. Um, taking ACTs and SATs if applicable, and we're going to talk all about that test optional thing. That'll be a whole part of this presentation. And then career exploration and visitation. We have a lot of colleges that come here that came last spring, and a lot are coming as we speak. So we're going to talk about how they take advantage of those opportunities. So what we did last week is gave them their senior packet, um, and we went over a presentation, which we're going to go over with you guys today. We asked them to complete the senior questionnaire. I think as of this morning, about 141 of them completed that um, out of close to 300. So definitely ask your student if they completed the senior questionnaire. It just goes to their counselor. It just really helps us understand where, th where they're thinking, what their plans are, um, so that we can start pushing information their way. You know, if they say they want to study nursing and we have opportunities come in from UH or Cleveland Clinic, we can pass it along to them. So it's really helpful for them to fill that out for us. Um, they started their college list, and they started that last year, but um, they're continuing to work on that in Naviance. We talked to them about registering for ACT and SAT if needed. They're working on their common application and their college essay, which was their summer assignment in English, so that should be done. They're probably just waiting for feedback from their English teacher. And then we talked about an autobiographical sketch and resume, which we'll get to later in the presentation. So this QR code um, links to the senior packet. So we handed them a physical senior packet. We also emailed them a digital copy of the senior packet, and we will do the same to you. Um, it's just a five-page document that's really critical. Um, the first page has all the important dates and deadlines um, from this meeting to graduation in June, um, just so that they can keep track of everything. It has the college application steps, which we're going to go over in detail tonight. The application link for local scholarships. That's not due until January, um, but that is in the packet, and that's something they shouldn't wait to complete. So it's a link to a, a digital application for local scholarships. Um, and then there was some information for the common application in the packet that was important information they're going to need, their counselor information. Um, class size and some other details that when they fill out the Common App, they're going to need to have at their fingertips. They also receive their transcript, so you can ask them about that. We gave them their uh, a copy, an unofficial copy of their transcript to look over um, before we start sending those out to colleges, employers. So just, they have it in their hands. If, if you ask them and they lost it and you would like to see a copy, just email us and we can send you a copy of their transcript.
Okay, yeah, the question was, do the transcripts have the class rank? And that is, if they're in the top 10%, which means if they have, you know, the if they're one of the top 30 in the class, it has a rank. If it does, if they're not in the top 30 or top 10%, they do not have a rank. Correct, yes. And that's one of the tips we're going to go over. You're going to be, at, they will be asked on applications what their rank is. And if they are not ranked in the top 10%, they should put, we do not rank which is pretty typical of selective high schools across the country like ourselves. So um, that's, how, that's what they would indicate. So the steps to apply to college, um, the first step starts with them, obviously, is it, after they've done their research and they know where they want to apply, they're going to start the application. There's basically two ways to apply, primarily. Um, they can apply on what's called the common application, um, which a lot of schools use, and what's nice about that is the bulk of the application you do only once, and then all the colleges that accept the common application, you just fill out specific questions for their college or university. Um, so it does save the student a lot of time. So if the college uses or allows the student to apply via common application, that is definitely recommended. Um, some schools like Youngstown State, for example, they don't use the common application. They only have their own specific application on their website. So they either apply on the college's website or common app. This is a link that um, you can look at later. I'm not going to pull it up now, but if they're using the common application, it's just real helpful if they get stuck on a section and they're not sure what they're being asked. Um, it gives best practices and tips on what they should enter in that particular section. Of course they can ask us, and that's over the next few months, that's a lot of our time is spent with students. They bring in their device and they pull up their Common App and they're like, I don't know what to put here or does this sound okay? Um, but this would just be a, a starting point in addition to speaking with their counselor. Uh, this was in the senior packet, so the question, you know, of rank, that's on there. They're going to need the school code. They're going to need the class size. And a, a question we often see misreported, they're going to be asked this GPA scale and GPA type. Um, our students that take AP classes, sometimes they want to put that we're a five-point GPA. We are not. We're a four-point GPA with the grade type being weighted. So they will be asked both of those questions. Um, so just making sure they report that accurately. Um, and again, this is here because they are going to need to put their counselor's name and email address on the common application and most other applications. So they, they started the application. Um, the second step, or you know, once they start the application, they need to match their Naviance account. And we kind of spent more time with them on this part because it's something they have to do. But just as a supportive role, just ask them, did you match your Naviance and Common App account? And it, the best way to describe it is Common App is how the student applies. That's where they're doing the bulk of their work. Naviance is how the school submits transcripts, teacher recommendation, counselor recommendation, rating scales, all the other pieces and parts of the application that the school is responsible for. We use Naviance because it's the quickest method to get to the college. So we submit electronically via Naviance. We can't do that until the student goes and gives us permission to submit materials on their, on their behalf. So it is pretty simple. Um, they, there's a video that I don't think we put it on. Oh, we did. OK. I'm not going to show it right now. But this video, it's like less than two minutes, shows them how to do that. And, and we've kind of been looking. A lot of them have already done it. But if they get stuck and need help matching their accounts, definitely have them come and see us. And we can help them. So they've started application to the college. They've matched their Naviance account. Um, another step will be required of some colleges and not others. Letters of recommendation. Every college is different on this, on the requirements for recommendations. Some colleges straight out say, we do not accept them. And even if the student asks us, for example, Bowling Green, if they ask us to write a letter of recommendation and we write it and we go into Naviance, we can't submit it because the college does not accept them. Um, so they will tell the student on their common application and in their Naviance account, every school, once they enter the school, will, it'll say what's required. 
okay? Ohio State, do, they do not require letters of recommendation. They will allow one recommendation, and it'll tell them that again, uh, Naviance and Common App. So we told the students, the minute you know you're gonna apply to a college, and you start your common application, or you put the college in Naviance, you need to see what is required in terms of recommendation letters. Um, it was nice to have a long summer, but these poor seniors, they're hitting the ground running with these college applications. Recommendations are no different. They need to give the teacher time uh, to really commit to writing a really good letter on their behalf, so we said, Find out quickly if you know you're applying to college and you know which colleges you're applying to and you need a recommendation or multiple, Case Western requires two teacher and a counselor. Once you find out what you need, make sure you go and ask the teacher face to face. So they're supposed to ask the teacher face to face and then they have to follow up with a formal request in Naviance. That again gives the teacher permission to provide that letter of recommendation. In addition to asking face to face, the other requirement that all the recommenders are going to need is their resume, which they've already done, they just need to update, and then the autobiographical sketch, which they're currently working on, and that's basically a questionnaire about themselves. So they complete both of those so that their recommender has more information about who they are outside of the classroom. For counselor recommendations, um, and again, this varies from school to school. Some schools specifically require a counselor recommendation. Why would they do that? So a teacher recommendation gives the school an idea of how they are as a student, how they are in that subject area. The counselor recommendation gives them a more global perspective. How do they fit in the student body, okay? We rely heavily on the autobiographical sketch and resume. On the autobiographical sketch, they ask what we ask what teachers know them really well, so we might go ask some of their teachers, tell me how they are in class. Um, we are gonna use their student questionnaire, and we're gonna use a parent questionnaire, which I'm gonna get to in a minute. So we use a lot of different information to write our letters. And we typically write quite a few. So we are going to ask that if they need a counselor recommendation, that they let us know via a form that's linked on this page um, by October 1st. Obviously, if they decide to apply to a school after October 1st that requires a counselor recommendation, we're, we're going to do it. We would just like to kind of know how many we have and when the deadlines are so that we know how to like prioritize our nights and weekends, right? <laughs> so um, the recommendations. Um, and then the other thing that we just really tried to stress home, and if you could help on the home front, please don't ask a recommender the day before it's due. Many teachers will, I mean, just flat out say, I'm sorry, I can't do it, and then you're stuck. Or they'll do it, but it'll be like a form letter. It won't be very individualized. So just, you know, and if you need us to nag them, call, your, call the counselor, we can nag them too. But the, we definitely need at least 10 school days, two weeks prior to deadlines to, to get those ready in time. Um, the final step would be, and this is when the student is close to submission. So if they're just starting the application process, we don't want them filling out a transcript request form. Because once they fill out this form, it comes to the appropriate counselor, and that's letting us know that we can go ahead and send the transcript, any recommendations, any other required materials. We don't want those materials getting to the college before the application gets there. Okay, so we told the students as long as you're close to submission, you can go ahead and submit this form. Um, but it's the same with the recommendations. We're asking that they give us time to process these, because again, these we get a lot of requests for um, transcripts. So we're asking two weeks on that. Obviously, if they submit it late, we're going to do our very best, but we just want to avoid, you know, for November 1 deadlines, 100 October 31st requests coming in. And then the final step, which may or may not be a step for your student, is uh, submitting an ACT or, uh, or an SAT test score, if required or if they want that to be considered if it's test optional. And we're going to talk about test optional later. Um, so the application process and the timeline and all that, I mean, it's, we're hoping they're starting now if they're college bound, they're starting to apply to schools. Um, and then hopefully, you know, November 1st is a big deadline, December 1st is a big deadline. Hopefully by second semester they've completed all their applications, they're waiting for um, decisions, and, and they're waiting for financial aid packets. This time of year is very heavy on the college side. 
um, between now and December 1st of receiving applications. So it's very typical for the student to go to the college portal page and it's to say that they're missing a transcript or they're missing a recommendation letter. It takes time um, for all of that to catch up. So if, if ever they are worried or you are worried that something is missing and the deadline is approaching, the first thing we would suggest would be to call the admission office at that college. Nine times out of 10, they're gonna be like, oh yeah, we got everything, we just haven't updated our system yet. Um, but if, if you get panicked, you've called the college, you're not getting the response you need, obviously call us um, and we'll make sure we do everything to make sure they're on time. Okay, Mrs. Payslock. All right, good evening, everyone. So just in general, we're gonna go over kind of the admissions timeline and kind of the school months that your students will be working through to ensure that they're doing everything in a timely manner. Um, obviously, starting a little bit later in the school year, we kind of got to get the ball rolling um, pretty quickly here um, with September, October, because we do encourage our students to shoot for that November 1 deadline to meet most application deadlines that are out there. So really between now and end of October, we asked your students to set up those individual meetings with their counselors. Um, that's kind of the, the big goal that we, you know, uh, made sure to hit home with them um, because we can individualize the process with them and make sure that we can answer any individual questions and, um, you know, individual needs. Um, even though it was a summer assignment that the English teachers assigned um, writing their essays through the Common App or through the individual websites from the colleges, um, continue to work on those, get revisions from their teachers, and perfect those so they're ready for the college submission process. Um, we talked about requesting the recommendation letters in person and then formally requesting through Navion. So these are kind of the things that are happening simultaneously as they're doing college applications between now and November 1st or possibly December as deadlines are approaching. Um, completing the ACT and SAT testing, I'll talk a little bit more detail about that if that is part of the application process for the particular schools your students are looking at. Um, attend college representative visits to our high school. So colleges are even uh, starting to roll in here at our building trying to recruit our current seniors. And it is a great way for students to connect with the colleges that they're interested in. Think of it as a way of networking. Think of it as a way of putting a face to the name on a college application. Many of these college admission reps that come to our building are the ones reading the college applications. So we encourage students to get on Naviance and look for particular schools that they're interested in or applying to and set aside the time time during the school day where they're coming here specifically to talk to our seniors, ask good questions, ask specific questions about the college application, um, so on and so forth. So that's some things they should be doing in the next couple months. Obviously, then applying, so, you know, finishing out the whole application process, submitting and requesting a transcript. Um, what will be coming open is October 1st, the FAFSA, the th Free Application for Financial Aid. We will have our own financial aid night, October 3rd. So be planning for that as parents, um, but also just that's kind of the next step um, coming down the pipeline because once you start to receive notifications of acceptances, you're gonna wanna be uh, you know, knowledgeable about the financial aid packages that will come your way. So moving into second semester, um, the big thing we tell students is complete that local scholarship application that they all received this past week in English classes. That puts them in the running for you know, multiple scholarships that are specifically just for our students here at the high school. They can start searching for scholarships outside of just the local scholarships, whether that be scholarships specifically offered from um, the particular colleges they're applying to. Um, there's lots of websites or um, databases out there too that are pretty reputable, FastWeb or scholarship.com. They can create their own profile and they would be emailed, you know, scholarships that meet their particular profile um, and, and, you know, start looking for monies in different, in different avenues. 
And really, the ultimate goal is that May 1 deadline um, to make that college commitment and put down that deposit for the college that they'll be planning on attending. So finding the right fit. Many of our students are still in that process of the college search. And that's OK. I met with a student this morning, has one on their list, but wants to add to their list. And there's lots of different avenues to use to kind of continue that college search process. One of them is on Naviance, where you can do just a simple supermatch college search. You can plug in some criteria that you as an individual are looking for, and it kind of takes those thousands and thousands of schools that are out there and starts to narrow it down and make it a little bit more of a personal selection for your particular student. Um, for those of our students that you know, really just don't have any starting point, we do have some resources out there, one of them being Mrs. Borash, our career specialist that works with, uh, works with us over from our um, Cuyahoga Valley Career Center. And um, it's just as simple as making that connection with the student, parent, and Mrs. Borash, setting up a separate appointment where they can do a little bit more self, um, you know, like career awareness, self-exploration, and help them kind of narrow down maybe some programs of interest, careers of interest, and then that can in tune help in the college search process. So in those one-on-one -on -one meetings, encourage, or encourage your students to reach out to your counselor so we can set up that process if that will help them in the college search process. As part of the college selection process, it's just very important that they know themselves, know what you know they're looking for. I always tell the students this is the first time they have such a big voice and where they're going to be continuing their education and it's important that they use it. So using all their different resources um, out there, Naviance being one of them, Mrs. Borash being one of them, your counselors in general being one of them, you know, knowing what you're looking for is going to be key to kind of narrowing down the college application process. Um, coming and talking to the college reps that come and visit us here, attending college fairs, getting on campuses, all those different ways to connect to really kind of find that list of colleges that you feel are the best fit for you. I talked about the college visits um, that will be with the reps that come here. This is what it looks like on the Naviant side of things. When they log in as a student under the colleges tab, they'll pull down the college visits and then it lists by date um, what schools are here and then it's up to the student to just sign up and it might be during one of their lunch periods, it might be during one of their classes. We just ask that the student, you know, clear it ahead of time with the teacher if they're missing a class. But again, a great way to connect um, and to network with some of the colleges that they're interested in and or, you know, really going to apply to. So factors considered in admissions. We always tell students, you know, overall, many colleges look at a student in a holistic approach. They're looking at not just the student, not just the grades, not just certain things, but what is that student as a whole going to bring to our campus? And some of that is um, our, your response to your essays, some of it's your test scores, some of it's the extracurricular activities that you're involved in. So it's important to include all of these different aspects in your college application, and you will be asked about that in various aspects of your application, whether it's the Common App or a specific application to that school. But really, when we're looking at the most important, or what tends to open the door for most schools, it tends to be these top three factors that kind of open the door or keep that opportunity open to your students. The grades, test scores, if it is required, and the strength of the, your curriculum, okay? Um, especially in some of the more uh, you know, difficult schools to get into, these really are going to be important. And then the next three factors that kind of Combined with that would be the essay that they've been working on, letters of recommendations from teachers, counselors, and the extracurricular activities leadership they have shown both inside high school and outside of high school. So we talked about the writing of essays and how that was a summer assignment that was given to them from their English teachers. Many students have probably already written them or are working on them. The next step in the process is submitting them to their English teachers, getting revisions, and really getting to that final piece that they're ready to submit. And that really 
brings a voice to their college application. It's kind of that time where they get to speak a little bit more about themselves, more about their experiences, other than just straight facts from a college application. So, Ways to apply. So students, were to we talked to them a little bit about that November 1 deadline. Shooting for that November 1 deadline gets them into, or gets them to meet most college applications that are out there. But there are some kind of benefits to applying maybe early um, or applying regular decision. It just depends on your individual student. Obviously with a regular decision, it might just be a uh, deadline usually no later than April 1st. Um, you're usually applying with the masses of every other student that's applying out there. So regular decision might be a great fit for some of the colleges that you're applying to. Um, early action, I'll skip to, is just applying early. Um, and that's applying earlier, getting an earlier response. A lot of schools have the early action as an option. Um, it's a wonderful option. It typically could be like a November 1, maybe a December 1, December 15th off the top of my head deadline. Um, lots of perks to that because sometimes with an early action you are in within a smaller application pool. Um, so keep that in mind. It's nice to get an earlier decision too on the other side of um, the new year. Early decision, this tends to be a little bit more of a personal decision for the student, for the family, because this can only be one school that you were to apply early decision to. This can tend to work for a student that has one school in mind and is dead set on one school, and maybe it's a reach school for them, or a school that they meet some of the criteria for, but not all. Or maybe some of the uh, schools that are maybe an Ivy League school, or a school that has a little bit more of a, a leaner admission rate. Um, early decision can be a way that you send a message to a, to a college that you are very interested and you are showing that you are willing to pull all your other applications from all other colleges if you are accepted there regardless of any other decisions that are made. So it's one school and one school only and again I always encourage students to kind of have that conversation with parents, their counselor to really decide if that's the best fit because there is, for most schools, a financial um, you know, tag you know, that goes along with that, because if you do deny or decide to not accept that early decision, there is kind of that binding agreement that you have to walk away from. So for some students, it's you know, that one best fit that they really want to try and get into. Early decision might be the best option for them. And then rolling admission, that's obviously a school that will extend uh, ex uh, accept applications rolling throughout the school year really until they have met the the need that they have uh, as far as population goes for students and it usually takes about a month or six weeks or so to get a response back. So college entrance tests. So we talked about how it may be um, required for a school or might not be. I would say with COVID as a fallout of that, um, college admission tests really kind of changed in the game of college admissions and whether or not it is required. So we told students to make sure as they're adding colleges to their list of, school, of schools they're going to apply to, make sure they know whether or not an ACT test and or SAT test is required for admissions. Um, it might be a little bit tricky because some schools might say they're optional, but a specific program within their school might say you need to submit an ACT and, uh, or an SAT. So they need to be sure that they're lo really looking at the fine print as far as certain programs they might be um, applying to. A good rule of thumb is if a school is optional, is to take a look at the criteria of the admissions of the previous freshman that uh, previous freshman year that the students were accepted. Look at their average test scores and see if your student meets or exceeds those test scores. If so, that would be a great opportunity to send those optional test scores. And then the flip side would be if it is optional and your student hasn't met the average, then they might want to have a conversation with their counselor in deciding whether or not it is best for them to send those test scores in. Some merit scholarships are also based on test scores. 
scholarships, things like that. So that's something to consider when applying for colleges and deciding whether or not you're going to be sending the ACT or SAT. So many of your students already sat for an SAT in March. They probably sat for maybe an ACT or another SAT this summer. Um, some of them might be even planning for one in October that's coming up, October 1 for um, ACT, so on and so forth. So just again, making sure that you're planning for that, that you have your scores ready to be submitted if you need them at any point. Here's some free test prep options. There's lots that we have, uh, Khan Academy being one of them that your students should be very familiar with and using. Um, we have one through Naviance, Naviance Test Prep. Uh, there's the links to these various free test prep options that your students can use between now and submitting college applications if they are retesting in any one of these admission tests. We require students to send their own test scores on their behalf. And most colleges want them directly from the testing center. So that's an additional piece that they need to plan for. We don't send them through Naviance or anything like that. They're not attached to their transcript. So they want to make sure that they log into their ACT account, if it's an ACT or their College Board account, and have those scores sent directly to the colleges that need them. Uh, we talked a little bit about the test optional. Just make sure they're doing their research and figuring out which schools they're optional for, which schools that are mandatory, and what is the best option for them in sending scores. And again, a conversation with your counselor is really a good idea to ensure that you're kind of understanding the process you know, at best. So financing college, we won't really go into a, a ton of detail with this because we will have our own financial aid night here on October 3rd, 7 o'clock in the auditorium. We'll go over the FAFSA, the free application uh, for financial aid. Uh, I talked a little bit about scholarships and how students can already start looking at scholarships right now, whether it's through uh, college websites, the scholarship um, databases that are out there and um, the local scholarships that we have offered to sp specifically our students here at BBHHS. And then the grants and loans piece, that comes from the FAFSA. So once we have that uh, financial aid night, you'll have the opportunity to start working on that FAFSA and getting it submitted sooner than later so you can look at the financial aid packages from colleges that your students are accepted to. So I already talked about that, the financial aid night. Take a picture, mark this in your calendar. Obviously, we'll send lots of reminders, but October 3rd, 7 o'clock p.m. here in the auditorium, uh, we'll have someone, a representative from College Now, that comes and specifically talks and kind of breaks down the, the financial aid um, application and the financial aid process. Uh, this is the woman who will be working with us from College Now this year. Um, she also partners with us where she'll do individual appointments with our families and students to maybe help answer questions about the application, to help you fill that out, um, maybe individualized searches with scholarships, so on and so forth. So we will send this link out because I believe she can start working on appointments even after tonight or I, do, I think they go live October after financial aid night. So after financial aid night, you'll have this link and you can start making these um, appointments with her. Next up, Mr. Drybolger. All right, good evening. Um, so yeah, what I'm gonna cover here is, is some good pointers for students and parents. And, and we've talked a lot about the nuts and bolts of the college application process and all the information. Um, a lot of this information is, is, I guess, somewhat more general, but it's equally as important um, for students and parents alike. So kind of the pointers we have for students, uh, first and foremost, is to take charge of the college application process. Uh, I remind parents and students, they're the ones who are going somewhere for four years, right, or, or, or two years. But students need to be involved in the process. They need to be filling out the applications. They need to be understanding of, of what they're getting themselves invested in. Staying organized is huge forms, deadlines, and requirements. Now as parents, I know sometimes if you're talking to your student and it's October 30th and they have a November 1st deadline, they're like, I'm not too worried about it. But you as the parent are probably like, okay, well I think we really need to maybe shore up some of these final things we need to do. That's certainly important, um, but I think students certainly need to, to be 
planning ahead, knowing what to do and when. I think from a stress standpoint for students, I say give yourself time. You know, don't, don't be trying to get things done on October 31st. As we've said, November 1st rolls around pretty quick. It's less than a month and a half away from now. Um, it's not as stressful if we're giving ourselves time and doing those things in a kind of logical manner. Uh, communicate. So students should communicate with you as parents. They should communicate with us as counselors and recommending teachers throughout the process. Uh, students, I think one of the, the biggest mistakes is they have a question, but they're afraid to ask it. Maybe they think it's a silly question or, you know, they just are talking to friends and listening to, to peers who probably don't know much more than they do. Uh, at that point so make sure they're communicating with you mom and dad you know keep those lines of communication open it's certainly good as parents to ask them where are you at what have you done you know what are the deadlines coming up how can I help how can the counselor help um, those are all good things to be aware of uh, we talked a little bit about fit and, and so focusing on the right fit for for you or for your son or daughter uh, it's not the most name brand school it's not where a friend is applying uh, it, it certainly, obviously, maybe shouldn't be where just maybe mom or dad went or grandma or grandpa went. Um, you really need to focus on, is this school a good fit for me? Um, as a student, do I see myself there for four years? Um, good things to ask. Don't panic. Uh, we're here to help you through the process. As Mrs. Bazelak said, having this kind of two-week delayed start to the school year, we know um, students are a little bit feeling the, the pressure of these you know, impending deadlines. So we're here to help. Like Mrs. Owen said, we, we would prefer that, you know, if you need a counselor recommendation, um, get that in by October 1st. Will most of us be by our computers on October 31st at 1130 at night just to check? Probably. Um, I always get one student in a panic who forgot to submit a transfer request or, or something happened. Do I like doing it? No. But we will certainly, we will certainly, we know that, that things happen. So we will, we will do our very best um, but, uh, you know, again, doing things in a timely manner, communicating with, with us as counselors uh, ahead of time and being, you know, with parents and teachers, uh, it's, it really helps in the long run. Uh, policing yourself. So I have had to add every year, I feel like, Mrs. Owens, we have to add another icon of, of one of these new social media platforms. Uh, we know that Facebook is ancient, but we know we'd keep it on here just for <laughs> sentimental purposes, I suppose. Um, uh, students, I think, don't realize, and I'm sure as parents of, of 17 and 18 year olds, when, when we were, uh, myself, Ms. Owens, or any of us were growing up, um, you know, there, there was no social media. Um, kids sometimes don't have the best judgment or might make mistakes. Uh, fortunately, 25 years ago, there was no social media, live videos, uh, chats, Twitter, all of those things. I think sometimes every student, even the most well intentioned or, or, or you know, seemingly straight laced, 16, 17, eight year old, 18 year old student might, you know, when it comes to putting something online, whether it's a video, whether it's a tweet, whether it's a Snapchat, um, you know, sometimes those things that I tell students might not be the most flattering about you as a person or might not put you in the most positive light can certainly come back to haunt you. Um, when you're talking about selective colleges and selective schools, it is not uncommon for some of these folks in their admissions offices or during admissions interviews to do a little homework and to see, you know, kind of go on and, and see what might be out there uh, in the social media platforms of students. Uh, a lot of students, I think, sometimes think, well, it's mine's password protected. I have all the security features on there. Uh, so no one can really find me or no one can see it. That said, I mean, and those are wise things to do. Uh, social media can be used very positively, and I think we're starting to see that in these last few years that obviously even you know, we as a council department using Twitter, using a, a live feed right now to broadcast this out to, to maybe our folks at home. But uh, I'm telling students, and especially your seniors now, if they can go on and they know that there might be things in, on their Twitter accounts or, or YouTube channels, um, TikTok, or, or maybe things they have out there that potentially don't paint them in the most positive light if someone were to see it, uh, who's, who's maybe considering you for a scholarship, um, or, or um, for admission, for employment, um, any of those things. Now is the time to kind of go on, you know, let's delete those things, let's get those things off of there. Kind of take the time to kind of clean up your social media accounts so that they show you as you feel like you should be seen. A good rule of thumb I always have is if, hey, you're not going to sit down and open this up in front of grandma or grandpa to show them what you're doing on there, it's probably a good idea to get rid of it. 
uh, from college admissions counselors. And this is, uh, I worked in college admissions for, for three years, uh, so I do have you know, a view from the other side of the fence is, is some of the things that college counselors are telling students. Um, keep your grades up through the entire year. Uh, any parents in here have a student that really maybe initially thought they needed to take an easy schedule this year or were very concerned about how open campus was going to work or anything like that? And I mean, maybe I think every senior, even our, even our, our, our high-flying AP students, you know, sometimes get in the mindset that I've really worked hard these past three years, and although I know senior year I'm going to do this class or these AP classes, I really want to be able to just kind of relax and, and get some time to myself and, and have fun. And we certainly want these students to have fun. But your grades need to be you know, reflective of what you've done the past three years. Uh, if we do have, and again, I think the reality is obviously here at BBHHS, we have you know, high performing standards for our students, and they expect much of themselves. And you and his parents expect much of your sons and daughters academically. Um, college representatives or admissions folks will take notice if they get an updated transcript through January and an AB student now has Cs or Ds. You know, there are certain red flags or things that that might kind of raise an eyebrow. Um, and sometimes students think, well, these, you know, I'm done. They're only going to look at my transcript or I, or I was already accepted, so now it doesn't matter what I do. You need to have these grades, you know, and students rather have to have these grades be reflective of what they've done and finish the final product strong. Uh, taking strong and competitive classes this year. Uh, math, science, world language classes if, if students are still at that level, but it's important to challenge yourself. You know, it's very easy, I think, for students sometimes to say, I don't need to take a science my senior year, so you know, I, I, I prefer not to, or I don't have to take that extra year of language, or maybe I could pick up uh, an AP class, but you know what, I'd rather have uh, the end of the day open for, you know, open campus or so I can get ready for sports. It's important to say, you know, this is more than just this year. This, this is planning for the next, the next four, next two, however long past this. Um, and I said, like I said, acceptance is contingent upon all years of high school. So finishing strong is essential. Point is for parents. So kind of switching gears a little bit for, for you guys. Um, let the student control the application process. It's like we talked about offering support is important, probably checking in on them, making sure that, hey, are you on top of what you need to do? Are you meeting deadlines is all very important. But do not do the applications for them. Uh, as a college uh, admissions, or I was an assistant director of admissions, rather, it was very easy for me to say whose mom or dad wrote this personal essay or whose mom or dad filled out this application. Because to be honest, it often just doesn't quite look right. So uh, students should be doing it. It's OK as a parent to be involved in the process. Make sure you know that they know what they're doing. And ask us as counselors if you have questions. Uh, but when mom or dad try to take it over and do it themselves, it very rarely works out well uh, for one reason or another. Uh, reassure sons and daughters, obviously, they're your kids. You love them. You're going to be proud regardless of their admission decisions. But at the end of the day, it is their decision, right? At the end of the day, they're going to this, not only going to school, they're living on campus. They're sleeping in the dorms. They're eating in the dining halls. They're spending their weekends there. This needs to be a place that they're comfortable being at and a good fit for them, not a place that, well, I think it's a good fit for them. Or, you know, it's a family legacy and, and my son didn't really want to go there, but that's where he's going. You know, if students are not happy where they're at, especially at the college level, it is very hard to pretend to be happy for four years. Um, so do students transfer or, or have schools ultimately maybe are not the best fit? Of course, that happens you know, quite frequently. But students should really try to make the best decision for themselves out of the gate. Using resources, Mrs. Bazelak went through a lot of the different resources we do have. The counseling website, uh, Naviance is great. It has a lot of that very specific statistical information about colleges and majors and, and, and student populations. Students don't realize it, but when you add colleges to your, you know, colleges I'm, I'm thinking about or colleges that even I'm applying to list, you can pull a lot of the information just from clicking on that school, right? So use that to your advantage. The senior packet that Mrs. Owens talked about, really we kind of boiled it down. It's basically like the Cliff Notes version of everything you'll need in about six or seven pages. So make sure you look through that as well. Make sure your student kind of earmarks it or keeps it with them. Um, because it certainly will help out when, when folks get stuck. There is a school out there for everyone. Help your student find the right fit. So I know I, the questions that I've been fielding thus far from especially, you know, 
early on here in the fall is, is some of you, you, know, you in here or some other parents and students I've talked to have visited a, f a few schools. They haven't really liked maybe or loved what they've seen thus far and are starting to get a little bit nervous or frustrated because they just don't feel like they're going to find that school that's a good fit for them. You're going to find a school out there for you, and, you're, and your son or daughters will find a fit. My words of wisdom are keep looking, ask good questions, utilize college tours. Those are for you, right? Those are for the students. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, don't be afraid to see the things that are important to you. Uh, if you're looking at a specific major, like I uh, ask to see the college engine. Excuse me, College of Engineering. Ask to see the School of Music. Ask to see where their business program is. Ask to see a classroom if you can. Using some of like we all like to walk around a campus and kind of go, ooh, the dining hall and this is great, and they've built this new building. Make sure uh, you, as parents and students, make sure you're prioritizing what's important to you, and that will help you in the long run when you're talking about fit and making the right decision. Okay, so FAQs are frequently asked questions that we we get. Um, if I apply online, am I done? No. Remember, if you apply online and students, whether it's a, through the college's website or through the common application, I always tell students, here's pretty much your steps in succession. Okay? You apply online. You, if you're sending test scores, you go next. You, you go into your ACT or College Board account for your SAT. You send your test scores. If you're not and you're optional, okay, step three, request the transcript on the transcript request form we have listed for you for the counselor. Sometimes students, and I, I said this in my senior presentations, it, it's a daunting process, but I think there's just something with kids' minds that think we either are psychic or we just automatically know that, hey, John Smith submitted a transcript, or he needs a transcript, I better send it. His, you know, his application was submitted. We really need students to understand that they have to follow the steps of the process. So those are your three steps. Trans, or excuse me, application, test scores, if, if applicable to you, transcript request, okay? And then also teacher recommendations, I would say, right? And, and most of the students, I think, already, if you haven't done so already, your son or daughter, have these teachers have those letters ready, right? And I think most students are doing their due diligence now so that when you have those upcoming deadlines, that teacher can send that, you know, letter through Naviant. It's a fairly streamlined process. Okay. I already said this, I probably should have gone to this slide. Apologies, Mrs. Owens. <laughs> um, pretty much the same thing of what I said, but yes, just make sure, again, students, this is the, sometimes the biggest mistake is a student submits a, an application and just forgets these next steps. Okay, what happens if I apply online and then receive an email stating that the admissions office did not yet receive my transcript and other materials from the counseling office? Don't worry, online submissions need to catch up with what is sent from the counseling office, and you can check your Naviant to confirm status from BBHHS. I will tell you, as much as we live in, an, in, a, in a world of technology, for many schools, and it was true at the college that I worked at, students submitted their applications online, and we had five people at computers who had to go through and mark the materials as they came in. And these folks stared at computers eight or nine hours a day getting processing done. It really hasn't changed all that much. It's just that certain schools employ more people or have more bots that do it. But the point being, once you apply to a college, because they're trying to get your information as quickly as possible, they have emails that automatically start requesting information immediately. So you might get an email 48 hours after you've submitted your application that says your transcript has not been received. Well, of course not. It's been 48 hours. They're just doing this because their goal is to have you complete your materials as soon as possible. Okay, so you can check Naviance. If we send you an email, and how Mrs. Owens, myself, and Mrs. Bazelak, if we send you an email that says, hello, John Smith, we've sent your transcript to Bowling Green State University on this day, we sent it, okay? So you can have that as documentation. You can check with us. But this is what Mrs. Owens was talking about when, when sometimes students come down in a sheer panic because they get an email that says, you know, you don't have your materials or we don't have your application if you just did it, Okay. Make sure it's going to take some time to catch up. Should I wait until the uh, should I wait until I take the ACT or SAT for this fall cycle to submit my application to colleges? Truth is, you need to complete and send your applications ASAP or within whatever deadline time frame you're working with. You should have your score sent directly from the testing agency. And admissions and scholarships will not allow for late scores. I think this is a pretty 
common example, a student wants to retake the SAT or the ACT in the fall, and they say, okay, well, I haven't registered yet. There's an October 10th or October 15th date for a test. I have a November 1st or November 15th deadline for my early action. If I take the test, am I going to get my scores in time to send? The, it will be close. So students really need to think about, you know, at this point, if you have rolling admission or you maybe are under the regular admission type deadline time frame, okay, you probably have some time. If you're looking at a November 1st early action deadline or any type of early decision deadline, it would probably be a pretty tight window to take a test within the next you know, couple weeks or, or, or month and get it in time for that deadline. You can try, it's certainly not something above if folks feel that I really need to get my test score up, I, want to, I need to send a test score in. However, it's just important to know that you need to have your application complete by whatever deadline time frame you're following in order to be considered. What is the advantage of completing college applications early? Uh, you're, early you're notified earlier of a decision. So an early action deadline, which we've said there's no real obligation, and early action deadlines are, are pretty much three standard windows. It's November 1st, November 15th, and December 1st, almost exclusively for any school in the country. Uh, the advantage to that is students in, in most schools are saying if you have an early action deadline, you apply by November 1st, you're hoping that you, the colleges are going to get your decisions out by uh, right around probably the holidays. I was actually at an Ohio State event the other day, and they have a date in December and then a date in January uh, where they'll be releasing those decisions. And the reason and the advantage to it is, is you get to know, obviously, weighing your options sooner. Getting a decision in January w is probably a much easier and less stressful than getting a decision in March or April um, w when you soon have to submit a tuition deposit. And more scholarship financial award opportunities. Uh, most schools will tell you, you know, students have a better chance if they apply within the early action deadline time frame for scholarships. Do grades really count senior year? Don't high school transcripts just show grades 9 through 11? So I don't want to completely repeat myself because we touched on this. But yes, your transcript reflects all grades 9 through 11. Senior year does matter. Many colleges, especially colleges that are, are selective or competitive with their admissions process, will ask to see a seventh semester transcript or first semester senior year transcript, and all will ask for a final transcript that, that shows that you have graduated in May or June. Admission status can be revoked if your transcript shows a decline in performance. Has this happened? Yes. I tell students the simplest way to go about this is don't put yourself in this position. Finish strong, keep your grades consistent, and put together your best body of work all the way through the very end. Must, letter, must my letters of recommendation be from teachers? And I, I have had this question probably 10 or 12 times uh, in the last few days from students. The answer is this. The recommenders should know you well. So, you know, a teacher who's had you maybe one year or two years, a teacher that you work well with or, or know should certainly probably be at the top of your list. It could be a teacher, an administrator, it could be a coach, maybe a club advisor, employer, or, or youth leader. So any of these folks who know you well are certainly options. Uh, be sure to follow the instructions of the application. Oftentimes it will be laid out very clearly that certain schools might say we require one teacher recommendation and then a student goes and gets one from a coach who doesn't teach them other than, other than sports. That's not what they're asking for. So make sure, in, in from your student standpoint, they know exactly what the college is asking. I think a teacher, because we're talking about, it's great to know your character. If a teacher can speak to your academics and your character as, as a person, that's probably your best option. If the recommender ends up not being a BBHH teacher, uh, you can invite them via the Common App under the FERPA and Recommender section. So this is a huge question we get because Folks outside of the district, and it can even be coaches if they're not employed as teachers here, don't have a Naviance account and can't send letters of recommendation through Naviance. The easiest and I think most uncomplicated way to go about it is using the Common App and they can recommend or, or add them that way. Uh, folks outside of education sometimes are, you know, they're not used to what they need to see. So if you do take this route, I would have your son or daughter really, you know, understand and, and, and tell maybe this coach or this youth leader or whomever, you're going to get an email, it's going to be from common application, you're going to have to follow the steps because it's, it's not 
it's not, I guess, as easy as, as it is for maybe us who work in education who kind of know the steps. So make sure your, your son or daughter asks them through Common App or, or recommends them, and I would probably say it'd be wise to follow up with that individual and just make sure they were able to do it without any issues. Um, and sometimes that happens. Could you recommend any resources or books that would be helpful at this stage of the process? We sure can. You can use us as counselors. Uh, your English teachers, and these are folks who, you know, when we're talking specifically about the college essay, your personal statement, uh, using Naviance, using our counseling website, we have all of the links, everything we're doing, every, any, any uh, presentations we've done with the students, anything we share out, um, anywhere else ends up on our, our page, so you can look at those websites, you can watch videos, all of those things, that, anything we really do, we have a record of. The college reps visits, we already talked about the, the, the um, schedule and Naviance. The college reps are great because if, you, if your student or son or daughter has specific questions about a, a college, it's probably great to sit with that person for 10 or 15 minutes and you can probably get all of the pieces of information that you need to know. Uh, the College Now, as we said, um, College Now offers individual meetings. I, I think they are really a great resource if you have very specific questions about financial aid of the FAFSA. Everybody's financial situation is different. Um, we have, you know, between us, we have some experience, but, you know, when it comes to some of the finer details or, or, or information related to folks' own, you know, financial statements and, and W-2s and, and some of those other things that are going to be required in that process, it's probably best to sit with them because they really know, you know, what they're talking about. Helpful books. Colleges That Changed Lives by Lauren Pope, Gatekeepers Inside Admissions Process for Premier College. Those are great books. The Inside the College Admissions Process is also a book that I used to use with my uh, students when I was in the um, uh, admissions field. Student Guide to College, and, and although it has a weird name, The Naked Roommate and 107 Other Issues You Might Run Into in College is a fantastic resource for not only the admissions process, but for students about things that you will encounter in your first year of college. Uh, and we might be fortunate enough, the, the actor, is, or excuse me, the author is um, a New York Times bestseller. He was able to host an event, a virtual event last year for our seniors, even in, in the spring. It was a great, we got a lot of good feedback. Um, so I will have information. We hope to get him here again. His name is Harlan Cohen. We'll get that information out if we're lucky enough to get him to do a, another seminar uh, probably up in the spring this year. College is not a prize to be run, rather a match to be found. So students, we tell them, trust the process, know yourself, communicate with us as counselors, communicate with your parents, um, know, you know, know your, your expectate, manage your expectations, know where you stand, uh, ask questions when you need help. There are no silly questions when it comes to the college process. Um, and we really look forward to working with all of our, all of our students this year, and it's coming quick. That's it. Yeah. Okay, so we will be available up here. We also, if, if there's any general questions any folks have. Um, yes, ma'am. The FAFSA, no, so the question was, does the FAFSA have to be completed in order to apply to a college? The financial aid process and the application process are two different entities. Um, Typically, the FAFSA also has their own deadline. So when we're talking about colleges, let's even take a school that has a November 1st, November 15th early action deadline. The financial aid piece is normally that it opens October 1st, and normally by February they might have a, a due date for FAFSA. February, February 1st, February 15th. And that can vary school to school, but if that's something you want to just make sure you know that information as well. Any other general questions? Thanks for coming, and we'll stay up we'll here. We'll stay up here if you have individual questions. Thank you.